Welcome to another morning coffee with Trevor. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews, and great to see you all this morning. Another great day. Uh, beautiful morning here. Once again, another balmy minus 20, minus 15, minus 20. So it's uh, great to uh, you know, get out in the fresh air and have a coffee, to be honest with you. Uh, how's everyone's morning going so far? Your temperature is at Fahrenheit or Celsius? Because we were one degree Fahrenheit this morning. So that's like negative something Celsius. Yeah, yeah. No, no, mine's in Celsius. Yeah. So it's it's like uh, maybe 18, you know, around that 10, depending on. <laughs> I haven't actually checked what the temperature actually is, but that's what it feels like. It's minus 12 Celsius out there right now. So, which is which is okay. It's not bad. You don't really need refrigeration. You can just use your outdoor, you can put your food outside. <laughs> May freeze though if it's uh, produce. So for those of you who joined yesterday, we started a conversation on CO2 and the safety of it, uh, using it as a refrigerant. And it's really important to uh, really understand those safety factors. It's, it's still just another refrigerant itself. And as a technician in the field, you need to understand those safeties. And that's, I think I, I can't stress that stuff enough. Yes, it's higher pressures. So you do need to understand where you're putting your gauges on, as I mentioned yesterday. But it's very important to take the time to learn about the equipment you're working on, right? That's the big thing. If, if you're working on equipment that uses CO2 as a refrigerant, you should figure out the, you know, the safety factor. And this is like with any piece of equipment as well. If it's a new piece of equipment you're working on, you should take the time to read the manual or find out about the equipment that you're working on because each piece of equipment is different. And nowadays it's way more complex with different PLCs, programmings. Yes, it's the same concept, but you'll see all these larger manufacturers um, you know, having proprietary software where it's, you need to understand how to look at their codes and get into their codes and, and figure out you know, how it works. So the, it, I won't stress this enough, or I can't stress this enough. You need to take the time to read those manuals. And I know it can be a pain and, you know, you have so many jobs and calls to get to, um, but you're going to be more stressed out spending an hour or two chasing your tail than really just picking up that manual and reading that manual for an hour or two and then really be get, setting yourself on your way to really troubleshoot and figure out the problem 73 degrees in trinidad well that's that's not so bad i, I could do with 73 degrees right now <laughs> i'd be in shorts for sure <laughs> so so getting back to to co2 it's um, there's a, there's lots of unique differences, uh, with it. Like, um, one of the ones is, you know, it's, it's miscibility with, uh, POE oil. So on, with HFC, you usually, usually using POE 32, um, with CO2, you're going to use like, uh, something more viscous, like uh, 68 POE 68. And really, uh, why you want to do that is, uh, so you don't, dilute the oil when you're back into the compressor you need to keep good lubrication and this is where a lot of manufacturers have seen a lot of failures and i've seen uh, many of them but when i did work at uh, copeland i've seen uh, a lot of failures i found out all about a lot of failures and inspected a lot of co2 especially scroll compressors um, as well as uh, semi-hermetics where they fail due to lubrication issues and so that's something the manufacturers really stress upon is to really understand checking that superheat. And we've talked about it uh, many times over the last two weeks about uh, superheat and the importance of it in different conversations, but it's definitely important in uh, CO2 applications. And that's why there's like special designs in the equipment itself that the manufacturers put in to try to help mitigate that. Uh, some use plate heat exchangers, some use uh, liquid to suction line exchangers, some use different um, pipe into different areas of the system to really increase that uh, temperature inside that line. So you're getting gas back to that compressor. And this is no different in any system. You do not want to get liquid back to that compressor because you're going to start washing out the oil and you're just going to 
run into to major issues uh, with failing compressor or, or damaging the compressors where then it doesn't work the way it should. And then, you know, you're losing capacity, you're losing um, the effectiveness of that, that compressor efficiency as well. You'll notice a few things with CO2 is that the, the pipe sizing will be different. And this is something that I learned uh, when I was working in the field doing uh, CO2 pump system. So it's a secondary system and you're pumping CO2 out to the cases. And uh, so it's liquid CO2 going down to the cases. And the thing is, is I was piping in a case and all of a sudden they were like, okay, it's a 5.8 line and a 5.8 line. I'm like, what do you mean it's a 5.8 line and it's a 5.8 line? You know, your suction's always bigger than your liquid. And they're like, no. And so that's something you have to be very careful with because when you're, when you're doing a, a, a system like that, the, the, those pumps, uh, pipes, uh, secondary pump system, you want to make sure you don't mix up those lines because we've definitely did that. Like on, when I was on the site, we've definitely made that mistake because there's so many lines. You got hundreds, hundreds of line sets. Like uh, I'm telling, like these are bigger stores, but you got lots and lots of line sets happening going out, and uh, you easily mix them up because you get the two same uh, lines coming down. Where when you had a standard HFC system, you know your suction's always a little bigger, so you could kind of uh, notice that just by looking. So that's, that's something that you need to be aware of. Uh, we talked about the pressures. The pressures are a lot higher. That's something you need to be uh, very curious about. And this is one thing about refrigeration, you know, uh, the more I've involved myself, the more curious I get. And I think that's what's pushing me to the next level, wanting me to get better because I'm really curious how things work. I'm learning about different things that really I haven't worked on before, um, like um, mini splits and VR, uh, VRV system and heat pumps. I'm really spending time learning on heat pumps because I know these are technologies that are going to continue to grow and, you know, technicians and companies are going to need to learn about them and uh, get their skill level up. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's about us spending the time to learn that technology, to really get better at what we do. And when you're curious about it, it really helps motivate you to uh, take that extra step to learn that product that you're working on because there's a lot more products. It's easier to get access to different equipment globally. And it's really important to understand those technology. And when you're curious, you want to find out more. And so with CO2, some of the other uniqueness I was just talking about potentially same size pipeline, uh, pipelines, those pipes are you going to see more, they're, more and more, they're going to be thicker. So the high, uh, to stand and uh, handle higher pressures on the, you know, on the transcritical side, that uh, discharge side going up to that gas cooler condenser, a lot of times you're going to see steel pipe um, really uh, different than when you're working on a standard, you know, rack or supermarket system because you have copper going everywhere. Now they're developed, uh, a few different manufacturers have developed thicker copper. So that copper can they handle like 120 or 130 bar, which, you know, 17, 1900 PSI. I'd have to look the conversion. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think there's one that's 135 bar. And so one, that's one thing that you want to understand what to do is how to do conversions, right? Going from PSI to bar, because you're going to see a lot of the equipment that is designed. It's either coming out of, a lot of it's coming out of Europe and I, most of the equipment that I first started seeing in, uh, you know, seven, eight years ago, it all was in bar rating. And I'm like, what is bar? You know, well, I did actually know what it was because when I was in Australia, that's what we use. But here in North America, you don't talk like that or you don't think about that stuff. But with CO2 equipment, when it's coming from Europe or another country that uses bar, um, you will uh, need to understand that. And so like one PSI is like 14.5, no, sorry, yeah, one, sorry, one bar is 14.5 PSI. So it's just, you just need to understand that. And then you can do the conversion. I highly recommend just getting a conversion calculator. Uh, here in Canada, we use Celsius uh, for when we talk about the ambient temperature outside. But when we talk about refrigeration, it's all in Fahrenheit. 
<laughs> so it's, it's uh, something that we always had to learn and get a better understanding of. And with CO2 equipment, you're going to see that. You're going to get pressure components that are rated for 40 uh, bar or 60 bar or 120 bar. That's what's going to say on it. More and more manufacturers um, are starting to put pressures on it. Sporl and Emerson, Dan Foss, the ones that are coming into North America. But you, you, you need to understand that. And uh, it just makes you a bit better uh, and make you think a little bit better when you're doing that. Uh, one, another big thing about CO2, it has a really good heat transfer coefficient compared to uh, other HFC uh, refrigerants. And that makes the system more uh, efficient in ways where uh, you don't need uh, as big compressors or as many compressors with uh, CO2 as say a uh, HFC system. And these are some of the things that you're gonna to start to see over and over again, where um, there, I haven't seen yet personally an apples to apples comparison, because there's lots of people saying that no, CO2 is not efficient as HFCs or synthetic refrigerants. And then other people say synthetic refrigerants are not as efficient as CO2. And I haven't seen an apples to apples comparison yet. There may be some out there. If you have any, please shoot them my way. I would love to see that, that comparison, but CO2 has a higher net refrigeration effect or volumetric, um, volumetric uh, refrigeration effect than, you know, the common refrigerants. It's kind of like uh, ammonia. It has like the, one of the highest uh, net refrigeration effect of refrigerants. That's why it's so widely used and it has lower pressures. And we'll continue to see the growth of these natural refrigerants, but that's one of the things that's good about our 744 is that it has that higher volumetric uh, refrigeration effect for systems. Anybody have any questions? I really needed to take a break to have some coffee. That's for sure. Anybody here worked on any CO2 systems yet? I don't think so. Maybe. Who plans on it? How about that? Who plans on, on working on some of the some CO2 systems? Someday we'll get something at the school, but that's so far away. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it all depends. Like there are some there's some schools out there that do have them and that train a lot on CO2. And it all is gonna be all about demand, right? It's how quickly are these regulations gonna change to how many pieces of equipment are gonna be installed. And when we start seeing double digits year over year, which we're seeing now and continue to evolve, uh, you're gonna start seeing more CO2 programs, hopefully into the trade schools and the colleges. Uh, hopefully they're, you're at least talking about it and brushing over, especially if you have refrigeration programs. If you have more of like uh, HVAC programs, residential and uh, commercial, CO2, you're starting to see a little bit trickle into there, but it's not as prevalent as in the, the commercial refrigeration or industrial space at this point, at this point. One of the other things that you, you will, will see and manufacturers are seeing is that you'll, you can have either a smaller condenser at the same uh, capacity than standard, um, synthetic refrigerants and that that helps with the cost effectiveness i've seen it over the years even in the last eight years the prices dramatically drop on equipment for a co2 because over time it's like anything over time you start to uh, have more equipment have more parts have more availability the prices start to come down is a, a co2 more expensive to put in than a synthetic uh, system yeah for sure because you've been using those for so long now you know, they've been parts and equipment been out for decades and decades. And, but well, you'll continue to see these equipment prices drop. Even electronic valves over the last 20 years have dropped dramatically. Like the prices are like night and day. And you're going to see even regular systems. And where are you seeing it now? You're seeing it now in, in applications 
where you're, it's all electronic valves and you're going to see it more and more and more. So as a technician out there, you want to understand um, how to work on that equipment. And it doesn't matter what refrigerant really it is there. Um, it's important to uh, understand that. Okay, what do we got going on here? Not much CO2 in uh, the Philippines. So they got the ice plants using ammonia. Oh, nice. You have an upcoming project with CO2. Well, that, that's fantastic. So what you want to do, Robert, is just definitely start brushing your skills up on that. I'm not sure if you're a technician or if you're a designer, uh, but you really want to start investing some of your time and, and learning about it uh, because it's still new. Like even uh, for manufacturers, they're still developing their technologies. Like it's been, I, I think from the late, in Canada here, I think it was like the early 2000s, late uh, nine, uh, 90s, early 2000s, really when it started to come into Canada again. And so last 20, 20 years, the technology has been developing. There's new um, strategies, new controllers, new components, you know, trying to get the standstill pressure up higher for the system so you can just shut it off and not have to worry about blowing the charge that's one of the big things i've talked to lots of technicians who are new with co2 is they blew the charge by accident by not by turning off the wrong breakers you know or turning off the wrong uh, switches which could potentially cause um, the release of uh, the pressure relief because the standstill pressures will increase quite quickly uh, there are strategies on how to pump it down, how to work on the system safely. Uh, and there's different designs as well, where we, you'll have backup cooling, you know, to make sure that that uh, flash tank or you have a plate to plate heat exchanger that continues to cool while the system's down for maintenance or service. But that, that is great. A oh, great job, Edwin. Yeah, start learning about CO2. It's, it's, gonna, it's coming, especially in commercial refrigeration. And it, it's good to, to build your knowledge and grow your knowledge on something other than what you work on day in, day out. Spending that, investing in yourself, learning a little bit more. It really brings more value to you and the value that you can bring to other companies. Um, if you're looking to make a career shift or move or looking for another company, just building that knowledge, having that repertoire to really talk confidently on the different parts of refrigeration. And CO2 is, I believe, and our, our, our 744 is gonna be a big one in the refrigeration industry. And it, it's already grown momentum, as I mentioned many times. So take the time to learn that stuff. Uh, talked about a, a bit about electronic valves. In those systems, it's all electronic. So you need to start learning control systems. And it doesn't matter if it's, if it's a, just a condensing unit system, small CO2 condensing system, or if it's a, a large rack, you need to understand those controls. And it, do, and it doesn't matter if it's with CO2 or not, you need to be learning control sides of refrigeration. Because that's, what it's, that's what it's coming to. You know, like the manufacturers are building control systems to recognize issues quicker, shut system down, to prevent for failures, right? Because warranty costs a lot of money for everybody, not just the end user, not the contractor, not the wholesaler, uh, the manufacturer. So everybody, it costs everybody money. Us as a technician or you as a technician, yeah, you may be getting your hourly wage for, for going and doing that repair, but you know, it's costing everybody money. Sometimes you will get warranty from the manufacturer. Sometimes you won't. So it's important to follow the guidelines figure that out. And this is why I see, we see more and more manufacturers building in electronics to protect the, the system. Shut that down. You're going to see it more and more and more. And you need to understand how it works. Because I've seen tons of times where technicians just cut out the, the safeties or bypass stuff that because they didn't know why something was happening. You know, compressor continues to trip off, trip off, trip off. They're like, well, it's because of this certain control. They bypass the control. Oh, everything runs. And then they get a fail compressor or a catastrophic failure in their system, in the customer system, which leads to lost product, lost time, downtime. And you do not want that. You know, 
I never wanted that, you know, and I always wanted to try to do my best, even though a lot of times I didn't have all the confidence. I didn't know all the answers, but working towards the getting better each day, it makes you better as a technician out there. We did talk about this a bit yesterday is uh, trapping CO2. That's something you do not want to do. You really need to understand the valves that you're opening and closing. And this is once again, why training is so important and over and over, doing the training multiple times, you know, uh, I really recommend I've, I've now it's like reading books for me. I've, I used to just read a book when I started reading and then that book would go on my shelf and it'd just sit there and that was it. Now I'm, learning to reread books because there's so many little tips and tricks that can be in there that you may forget you might not remember or you do remember but it's like how did that exactly work and then just refreshing last night I was going through some of my refrigeration manuals from when I did some of my apprenticeship and I'm like I have notes upon notes like just binders of notes I'm like when did I write all this stuff I don't remember, you know, because it's 10 years ago. Some of my courses are 15 years ago. And I mean, there's so much great knowledge that I was taking down from the different uh, teachers or educators that I was learning from this different courses I was taking. And I, I was just looking through and I'm like, wow, this stuff is gold. Like this is stuff that I want. I need to some of it relearn or remember because like I did like a gas fitter course, like I'm a, a fully licensed gas fitter in um uh, gas fitter A in Alberta. So that's a, a province in Western Canada. And I mean, I've got books on our, all our codes, highlighted the code book was inside out. And then I had a ton of quiz questions that I've wrote out and then questions I wrote for myself, flip cards I've had. I'm like, wow, look at all this knowledge that I've, I've consumed over the years. And to be honest, I do not remember a lot of it. I haven't been implementing a lot of uh, my gas code and you know, 10 years, at least, if not more, it's when I really, when I transitioned back into refrigeration back in 2012, maybe 2013. And I haven't implemented really much on the gas side. Besides when, I, when I did uh, work at Emerson, I was doing the, um, the gas, you know, residential furnace trainings uh, and air conditioning trainings on, on furnaces and stuff. Cause white Roger sells gas valves, ignition modules, um, all these little probes and, and stuff zoning system so I, I learned all that stuff again and understanding how to check you know your phase and the boards and all that stuff but getting deep into understanding you need to understand the codes for your local jurisdiction you need to understand like the gas and the electric uh, electricity all that stuff is stuff that you need to continue to uh, learn and have in your repertoire so you understand and it's stuff that you can forget along the way, just like that. When I was going through the stuff last night, I forgot a lot of that stuff. And I've even found a few books, like uh, when I was doing my ODP, ozone depletion ticket, because that's what you kind of need here in Ontario to buy refrigerant. Um, I was going through there, and I think the last, uh, the last time I did my update was 2012. And I've talked about CO2 in there. You know, I've have written information about CO2 and the global warming potential and, and the way the regulations were going to change, but I didn't really remember it. Until, like I didn't really, I thought I only started learning about CO2, you know, 2014, 2015, when I started, when I was working for Emerson and really got involved in it. So I was learning about CO2 even before I, I started teaching and training it. But once again, this is stuff that you learn, but you may not remember. So always continue to invest in yourself to make yourself better to grow to be more valuable to the industry your company your, your brand and uh, set yourself apart really from other technicians out there because when you're investing in yourself that's getting you one step closer to different goals and visions that you're working towards anybody have any questions Going through all the stuff happening there. Oh, yes, uh, Trevor, good morning. Good morning. Oh, yes, I have um, a quick question. Yeah. Um, R448A and R449, they are very good revisions. And uh, 
but I realize that people are moving to CO2 now. So do you think that manufacturer or companies will be able to choose between uh, CO2, going for CO2 or going for R448 or R449 later on? Okay, so, so, so there's going to be, it all depends on what the customer wants um, and what the, for example, what the contractor can do. You know, some contractors are not going to be able to install CO2 um, at that point, maybe because they don't have the skill level, the knowledge level to design the system. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see uh, uh, a lot of different conversations. Some people, like I said, it's going to be, say, they're going to say, well, CO2 costs is this much more to install compared to 448, 449. Um, it depends where it's going to be at in the, the world as well. Like, are you installing the system in Canada where CO2 would be more efficient because you'd be run, really running in subcritical all the time, or are you going to be running in the middle of Africa where you need to have more components and parts to make it more efficient? Um, and either way, it, there's going to be a learning curve. With the 448, 449, there's a lot of glide in that refrigerant. So now the technicians need to understand glide. Uh, where, where there's a bit of a learning curve to that, but it's still a similar design system uh, to what's out there today, like your 404s, your well, your previous system 404 and 507, where CO2 there's a bigger learning curve. Right. You know, so if you're the contractor themselves is a CO2 contractor, there's there's a few of them here in Canada where they mostly work on CO2 systems and build them, design them, so they have that infrastructure infrastructure built inside their organization um, so there's going to be a lot of people are going to say yes co2 is going to be better people are going to say no synthetics is going to be better it's going to be what um, what the customer wants for sure co2 is going to be a long-term refrigerant 448 449 is not going to be you know it's not a long-term refrigerant and when you start to talk about like a total life cycle of equipment how long is that how long are they going to be in business that that company and that's what they're going to look at at the end of the day am i going to stay in business do i want to be in business for 20 30 40 years this is what the big the big companies are looking at or am i just going to be in business for five years you know so a lot of the times what i see is that end users they just some a lot of times go for the lowest price and the lowest price sometimes costs them more than the higher price a lot of times actually especially if you don't have a quality contractor putting the equipment in. So it's hard to say um, which one is, you know, which one's going to be better for that specific customer, but I'm seeing a bigger trend for these larger organization corporations. They're going to uh, low GWP or natural refrigerant like CO2 and they're taking a bigger look at it. And uh, when you, when you start to see these big corporations mandate, and go and say, okay, we're going full CO2 on these stores, you're going to start to see it trickle down to all the smaller stores as well over time. Because when these big companies do a mandate like that, that means they're buying more equipment um, and there's going to be more built for say CO2 or R744. And then that's going to bring prices down for equipment for smaller companies to buy it, right? And make it more cost effective. Mm. I don't know if that answered your question, but oh, yes. a lot. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. Yeah, I, I like that uh, curve and invest in yourself and be your most valuable asset. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. The more knowledge you have, the the more you invest in yourself, the more valuable you are to the industry, to your company, to to your brand. Everyone, you know, a lot of people don't think about it, and I've never thought about this. Like I am, I do refrigeration mentor now, but I I am my own brand. Like I want to. Uh, you know, work hard, have knowledge, be able to share, give back and, and be better each day that I do stuff. So um, always continue to invest in yourself. Yes, read the directions there. And that's, that's something that's something that you need to do. Like, it's so important. Like, I can't stress that enough. Every training I, I do and people I talk with, and it doesn't matter if it's technicians or engineers or designers, because I've worked with lots of different people. It's like, you need to spend the time to read that stuff. Even if you don't like reading, figure out another way to uh, absorb that information. You know, one of the things that is not out there, there's not a lot of audio books on manuals. Maybe that's something I could start. Do a start doing audio books and manuals to make it easier for, 
technicians to absorb uh, what's going on. <laughs> yeah, thumbs up, right? Um, okay, well, seven o'clock. Thanks everyone again for hanging out with me and getting a conversation going and uh, I'll see you again tomorrow. Have a great day, everyone. Okay.